this is another one of my Dr. Seven Chalk and Talk uh, video responses. And in this one, I am responding yet again to a question that was asked of me in VU, a very interesting question, one that's uh, a bit personal, but actually, for me as a philosopher, necessarily leads into talking about some orderings of goods, some understandings of goods, some orderings of, of one's life. So the question is, what is your favorite thing about life so far? And that's an interesting question. I am 40 years old, so I am at uh, what you could say is the peak in some ways, right? They say it's all downhill from here. Um, as far as mental acuities go, um, for philosophers, historians, people that are working in the humanities, actually, you're still on the rise until they say, you know, 50s, 60s, sometimes even 70s. Physically, though, you are in decline. And it's also a good age in part because by the time that you're 40, you've experienced, most likely, quite a few ups and downs. You've experienced some successes, some setbacks. You have embraced and endorsed goods which turned out to be somewhat like fool's gold, not quite as valuable as you assumed they were. You may have sacrificed uh, some goods that appear to be more worthwhile for other goods, you have learned some valuable life lessons. You've also, hopefully, by the time you're 40, you've seen a lot of other people go through these as well. You've reflected on their experience. Um, so that opens up the possibility, in my view, of developing a better appreciation of what we call ethics in the, the very broad sense, dealing with how should you structure your life. How should you arrange the goods and, and the bad things within your life? How should you order them? How should you rank them? How should you prioritize them? Um, that opens, so being 40 years old opens up the possibility of seeing things in a somewhat clearer light than when I was 20, than when I was 30. Um, and so what is your favorite thing about life so far? The answer to that for me at one point was studying philosophy and uncovering the thoughts and the dialogues and the interplay of many brilliant minds. Now, actually, if I had to give an answer, and it might be different 10 years from now as well, what is my favorite thing about life so far? I would say the person's I have learned that people are more important than ideas, that there is a greater value that resides in each person, that there is in any abstraction, and that ultimately what makes life most valuable is developing relationships. Um, now, as a, I also sort of let the cat out of the bag, I, I am a Christian philosopher, so God is, is somewhere in there. I'll also uh, admit that um, God is, is at, certainly at this point in my life um, much less central than uh, within that, that, that ordering of persons than God ought to be. Uh, certainly if I compare myself to the philosophers who I work on, like St. Anselm and St. Thomas Aquinas and earlier Christian philosophers like uh, Hilary de Poitier and people like that. Um, now be that as may, Let's talk some philosophy. So, we have a whole lot of varieties of goods. That's kind of a play on isn't it? A whole lot of varieties of goods. There are many different uh, ways in which we understand the multiplicity of goods. And um, the, the listing that I'm choosing here is actually taken in part from the way in which uh, people like Dietrich von Hildenbrand have thought about using some of their vocabulary, but also some that Aristotle uses I'm also taking something from uh, Alistair McIntyre, although he's not the originator of this idea. Um, classically, you could distinguish goods into categories. So what are some of the big categories? Needful things, things that are necessary for us, things that if you lack, you suffer some sort of evil. Um, some of these are so basic that if you lack, then you die. Food, water, uh, adequate shelter. 
Some of them may take you a while to die. Lack of health ultimately reduces your, your time of life and it also reduces the quality of your life. There are certain goods that you need in order to have in place, in order to enjoy other goods. But they, they're not particularly great in and of themselves. I mean, you know, you could, you could live off of a very dull diet. But that would be something very different than uh, pleasant things, wouldn't it? It would be needful things, but not pleasant things. Now think of all the different pleasant things that you have experienced. Um, were I to do that, and I actually run them through my mind, we would need a lot of hours of dead air of me just sitting here thinking, remembering, imagining. There are many different pleasant things, and, and I'm, I'm ignoring the fact right, right now that we find different things pleasant, that perhaps uh, you don't enjoy cigars the way that I do, or the taste of a, uh, a bitter stout the way that I do, and I may not enjoy uh, the taste of some things the way you do. And certainly, I would find very few people who share exactly my taste in music or literature or art. Not that big of a problem. Point is, there are many different pleasant things. That's, that's another thing to consider in the range of goods. There are other things that we can look back on over time and say, you know, I thought that was a bad thing at the time, but it was necessary for my growth. Necessary in a different way than needful things. Needful things, if you don't have them, you, you, you know, you're not going to live, you're not going to live uh, in certain ways that allow you to, to experience other goods. There are other things that provide you with what feel like setbacks or frustrations, but they're needed in order to allow you to develop further. You know, for example, um, one of the things that I do agree with Lawrence Kohlberg on is that if we want to think about moral development, one of the ways in which we do develop morally is through conflict. When we disagree with each other and we have to defend our, our views on situations and we say, that person is a bad person because they did this, this, and this, and that's bad because of this, this, and this. And then somebody else says, no, no, you're wrong about that. And then we think about it. And sometimes we are wrong. Uh, you know, I've had the experience, for, for example, of uh, actually being kicked out of my mentor's office one time when, uh, back when I was a, uh, uh, a deconstructionist and I was pulling, you know, some Derridian things out of him. He just told me, get out of here. And, and I was shocked and hurt and surprised, uh, but I did. Um, and that was actually an important moment in my, in my development. So there are many things that make us grow. Not all of them are painful. Then there are what we can call intrinsically good things. And again, I'm not worrying about the fact that we find different things intrinsically good, that we appreciate things differently, that there may be some aspects of some objects that you grasp that I don't get, um, and vice versa. There are some things that are intrinsically good that we um, we find the goodness in them, the goodness that is there in them, and not just because they're pleasant, not just because they're necessary, not just because they're useful for something. There is something compelling about them. There is something that reaches out to us, something that impresses that upon us. And there can also be some things that are intrinsically evil, or there could be intrinsically good things that are very vulnerable, and we catch sense of that vulnerability, we want to protect it. Um, but the idea is that there are some things whose goodness resides in them. Uh, now some philosophers like Kant have said, oh, there's only one thing that's intrinsically good, a goodwill. I don't accept that. I don't buy that. And uh, phenomenologists of value like Max Scheler and Dietrich von Hildenbrand uh, don't accept that either. And neither did Aristotle. And Aristotle doesn't think that everything is, is uh, merely because of one other thing. Um, then there are also goods that have to be shared. There are some goods that you cannot experience on your own, or you cannot produce on your own, or you cannot fully enjoy on your own, or you cannot explore in their depths on their own. For instance, um, you can play a game of chess with yourself, and you can study the openings of great masters. 
But there's no substitute for having another person across the board. So they tell me, I'm not a good chess player, and I don't actually appreciate that. Uh, team sports are like that. You need other people in order to play soccer and enjoy that. That one I can't understand. Um, even to have, really have a good fight with somebody, you need a partner who you can fight with in a certain way, don't you? Although that may not be quite so, so good. Um, but there are certain goods that can only be experienced with others, and maybe even others of the right sort, others who have the right temperament, others who are in the right sense of relationships. And I think that we can, you know, think in very, very broad terms about, you know, when we're answering this, what's the best thing about life so far? What's intrinsically good? What have, what have you experienced that really is intrinsically good? We can look through a whole range of um, goods. There are some that are merely useful. They get us some other things. Think about, for example, wealth, right? Wealth is not good in and of itself. You know, here's a uh, dollar bill. Um, it's pretty, but its prettiness, what, what it has, not compared to other money, its prettiness is not really a function of its usefulness, is it? Um, I mean, a, a, a crumbled up one is just as good as one like this. Not good for very much, too, by the way, either, is it? Um, then there are things that are pleasant, right? And there's, there's perhaps a, a gradation between this. Maybe some things are pleasant or become pleasant because first they're useful and then we, then we experience them. And then there are intrinsically good things. And it's not as if intrinsically good things are not pleasant, um, but you don't like them just because they're pleasant. And we can think about this with, with several things. Aristotle, for example, talks about three kinds of friendship. And he talks about it in terms of the friendship useful and pleasant, and then he talks about in terms of virtue, but we could use similar terms about being intrinsically good, uh, appreciating the person for who they are, uh, appreciating your, your connection with them for what it is, not just something pleasant. Um, and I would say that the relationships that I have had in my life with good friends, with colleagues, with my children, with my family, and with my wife-to-be fit into that category of the intrinsically good, even if they're not always pleasant. And sometimes they actually are quite um, the opposite of useful. Sometimes they, they require a lot of you. These are all different things. These are all different goods or values that, that people have, have looked at over time. Um, I would like actually to close this by talking about somebody who saw, you know, God and persons as very important and, and saw a use for all of the rest of these, um, but decided that wisdom was best. And that is the, the uh, King Solomon, at least as far as we know him through, through scripture. Which, you know, might be a little bit uh, overblown, but, but, you know, he's credited as being a, a philosophical type. And I think that he really is. Here's how the story goes, at least with one of the versions. God actually says to him, what do you want? I'm going to give you any one of these. You pick. And he thinks. And then he says, this is a bad job that you've got me with this, this huge, numerous people that seem to be completely unmanageable. I'm going to need some wisdom if I'm not going to totally screw it up. That's the, the Chronicles version of it. Paraphrased a little bit. And then God says, all right, you pick the right one. You not only get wisdom, you get the rest as well. Um, there's something to that. He picked wisdom because it was useful, but he also picked wisdom because he desired it. Because there was something there that drew him, that, that you know, unfolded itself to him. And it's really interesting. In the biblical text where wisdom is personified, um, wisdom unfolds her riches to the, the one who seeks her. And it's not only pleasant, but there's also an intrinsic value to it. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Can you pursue wisdom by yourself? Yeah, I think you can. But isn't it so much better? when you do it in 